New Hampshire Superior Court and uh, hope to share some insights into the movie. It's quite entertaining. Um, and Barry, uh, obviously, with his depth of knowledge in film and film history, can share some of the details about the film itself and uh, the people who appear in it. I thought it would be kind of fascinating to have a, uh, uh, a real judge uh, comment on uh, not only the movies, but uh, uh, courtroom dramas uh, that have been uh, in film and on television. It seemed like uh, uh, the perspective of somebody who had been in the uh, midst of uh, cases that probably weren't as uh, uh, juicy as this one, but uh, definitely uh, the what do you think about courtroom dramas as as, as a whole as far as entertainment is concerned? I actually think they're great, and uh, this might come as a surprise, but one of the best courtroom dramas, and it is used constantly in lawyer training, is My Cousin Vinny, which isn't actually a drama, it's actually a comedy, obviously, but um, the that movie is used, it, it, I went, when I went to judge school in um, out west, that clips of that movie were used. It's used constantly for a variety of different things um, to teach in a funny way some important things that happen during the course of movies. And this movie actually has some pretty interesting, uh, you know, despite the drama of it, some pretty interesting features as well. The husband and wife, the spousal privilege, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about here, uh, is quite a bit different in New Hampshire than what they were um, alluding to in this film, and issues about perjury and what happens uh, <coughs> excuse me, during the course of a trial. Um, that, that sometimes happens in real life, where a witness admits or is confronted in a situation where they acknowledge or you know, they're, they're confronted with the situation where they're um, lying on the sand, and now suddenly they're exposed to um, their own uh, penalty. The story that you uh, watched here uh, started off as a as a as a short story back in uh, if I uh, can look at my notes here in 1925. Uh, it was written by Agatha Christie and it was called Traitor's Hands. And uh, about uh, eight years later, the story was published. For the first time, and initially it appeared in a uh, a weekly pulp magazine, uh, and it was printed in a in book form in an Agatha Christie collection in 1933. Uh, no longer called Traitor's Hands, it was called Witness for the Prosecution. Uh, originally, the plot ended rather abruptly with Mrs. Vole's admission that her husband was guilty. It went no further than that. And uh, uh, Will took the time to uh, indeed hear an audio book uh, of uh, Trader's Hands, and uh, I'll let him explain just exactly what uh, he heard. Yeah, it was quite a bit different, the ending, as uh, Barry indicated. Um, a lot of the plot twists that we saw at the very end of the movie, we, the, the murder didn't happen of uh, Leonard Vole, um, basically, at the end of the movie, there was an admission that uh, he did, in fact, do it and couldn't be prosecuted again because of double jeopardy, and that was essentially the end of it. Uh, one of the interesting features about this movie is actually the title of the film itself, which is Witness for the Prosecution. This goes to the issue uh, that I talked about earlier. One of the um, interesting aspects of the movie is whether Mrs. Bull could in fact be called as a witness uh, for the prosecution against her husband. Uh, and this involves an issue of what we here now call the spousal privilege. Um, and in some jurisdictions, apparently in England, I don't, I don't know the law of England, um, the, a spouse cannot be called against in this case, the wife cannot be called against the husband to testify against the husband at all. Um, that's not how the privilege works in New Hampshire. It's very much narrower than that. Um, in New Hampshire, the privilege is simply limited to communications that husbands and wives, spouses, it's not limited to husbands and wives nowadays. 
um, but it, it stems from that. It's simply limited, limited to the confidential communications that the spouses have with each other. So if a wife witnesses something the husband does, as in this uh, case, the husband coming home with blood on his sleeves, the wife could be called in New Hampshire as a witness for the prosecution without running up against the spousal privilege. In 1953, Christie's adaptation of Witness for the Prosecution opened as a play with several alterations. Bull's young girlfriend was introduced into the scheme of things, and Mrs. Bull executed her guilty husband. Uh, when adapted as a motion picture, Billy Wilder and Associates made additional alterations. Increased emphasis was placed on uh, Sir Wilfred and somewhat diminished uh, the, the role of Leonard Bowl in the original story uh, while introducing an entirely new character in the film, uh, private nurse Miss Pencil. Uh, this is the first time that she would appear in, in, as any part of a plot uh, called Witness for the Prosecution was indeed this film. Uh, her job, of course, was to control the activities of Sir Wilford. The, the other, uh, I guess, I don't know if I call it an odd uh, uh, change, but it was a change, and I, I never could find out exactly the reason. Uh, uh, Mrs. Bowles, uh first name was no longer Romaine, which is what it was in the original story, and in the play, it was now changed to Christine. Um, as far as the casting was concerned in the film, uh, originally, uh, an actor I know, William Holden, uh, who had worked before with Billy Wilder, was the initial choice uh, to play Leonard Bull. But he wasn't available uh, when they wanted him. Uh, Tyrone Power was offered the part uh, but initially turned it down. Uh, and here's a list of people who were, and I'll use the word momentarily, considered for the part of Leonard Bowl. Uh, Gene Kelly, Kirk Douglas, Glenn Ford, Jack Lemmon, and an actor by the name of Roger Moore, uh, who had had some success uh, uh, in, in a uh, uh, acting, uh, in that time period, uh, Power finally came on board when he was asked to follow witness for the prosecution with another Edward Small production entitled Solomon and Sheba. Uh, but I have to also add that $300,000 per film and a percentage of the profits probably uh, induced uh, Tyrone Power into saying, I'll be in film. So I wanted to see if anyone had any questions about anything they saw in the movie, about the courtroom scenes. This um, obviously is an English drama, English court scene, which is quite a bit different from uh, what we experience here in the American system. I don't wear a wig, for example. Um, but uh, anyone have any questions about what they saw in the movie, in terms of legal issues? Yeah, in the back. Hi, I have a question, yeah. How do you think this film stacks up against the Paradigm case, that Hitchcock film, which was from the late 40s, had a lot of the same actors in it, set in, set in Britain in the courtroom. Have you ever seen that? I, I, you know, I haven't, so uh, I'm not going to be able to compare them. You know that Paradigm case? Uh, I never watched that one. I, I, I have to be uh, uh, maybe uh, honest to the degree that uh, uh, everybody thinks that I've seen everything. <laughs> <laughs> They're wrong. You have uh, I, uh, I unfortunately have uh, my prejudices also as to, uh, uh, and also very selective as to what I do watch, even though I may watch stuff that if I admitted to watching it, you would say, why do you watch that 
uh, particular material. Well, every once in a while, it's always fun to, to watch something that you can really feel superior to uh, while you're watching it. And so I uh, tend to uh, sometimes gloss over things that I should watch. But I, I would probably also hasten to say that uh, as far as Hitchcock's uh, resume is concerned, I wouldn't put that uh, high on the list, that particular title, and that may be another reason why I never bothered to watch it. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm sorry that you, your question is not going to get not going to get an answered here. So you know, a, a couple of interesting aspects of this movie, despite the obviously melodramatic uh, um, scenes at some points, there were some glimmers of actual. Um, real objections that occurred during the course of this trial. That At one point, um, the prosecutor was asking, I think it was the inspector, for an opinion about whether you know, he thought a burglar could have done this and there was an objection. That's a legitimate objection that, um, in, except for fairly narrow circumstances, uh, only experts, expert witnesses are allowed to give opinions, like a doctor can give an opinion or some, something like that. In this case, the, the inspector was simply testifying as a fact witness, and he's not allowed to opine about what he thinks happened, and so there was a successful objection there. Um, and there were a few other points during the course of the trial when that happened as well, where there were objections based on speculation about what somebody thought might have happened. Um, so, you know, I was, I was impressed that they got the rules of evidence right in, in few, several spots. Uh, getting back to the casting element, uh, Marley and Dietrich had also worked with Billy Wilder before, and uh, I don't believe there were too many other people, uh, aside from, I, I read someplace where Vivian Lee uh, at one point in the conversations about who should be playing uh, Christine Helm, she was uh, apparently thought of and or considered for a very short period of time. But I think it was always uh, uh, Marlene Dietrich's uh, uh, point in uh, order to refuse to play or not be willing to play the part. Um, her only stipulation was that she would only play the part if, uh, as long as Billy Wilder was the director. Anybody else? And she was going to bow out. Um, other people that are in the cast probably, of course, are Charles Lawton and uh, his wife, uh, Elsa Lanchester. Uh, they met uh, in Britain uh, in the late 20s, apparently appeared in a, a couple of films, uh, silent films, as a matter of fact. and. Uh, uh, married and stay married uh, throughout uh, Lawton's life, even though there was uh, uh, some, some definite reasons why uh, you might think uh, that the marriage uh, may not have survived uh, that period of time. But uh, uh, they ended up being in, in about 10 movies together. And if, if this is any indication how they played off of one another, uh, those movies, uh, if they were uh, well written, uh, probably were very entertaining. Um, Lawton was uh, definitely a, a character, uh, and he had uh, an incredible career, which went into the 1960s. Uh, quite a few of the roles that he portrayed were incredibly memorable, uh, but he was not above perhaps being in films that, uh, as uh, I in indicated, why did you see the paradigm case? Uh, he's in a 1945 film called Captain Kidd. Uh, watch that at your uh, mental peril. It's, it's not a very good movie, and uh, uh, Lawton is, uh, I'll use the word ham, uh, to describe his performance. Uh, it's pretty handy. Uh, it was, and it was not the only time that he ever appeared in a film as Captain Kidd. Uh, in 1952, he appeared as Captain Kidd in a Warner Brothers release called But Abbott and Lou Costello Meet Captain Kidd. Uh, I don't think that, it, that was played seriously by Mr. Lawton, 
Uh, Ham Lawton is uh, very evident in a movie called The Strange Door from the early 50s as is a, a, a biblical spectacle which starred Rita Hayworth and Stuart Granger called Salome. Uh, the, these are, are performances that I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. Lawton may have wanted to forget, but uh, uh, they exist and uh, you can see them uh, uh, again. Uh, I, I don't recommend them, but if you want to see something that is definitely not of the same caliber, uh, those might do it. Uh, but he does uh, definitely, definitely appear, and I'll just list a couple of them so you'll understand uh, how, uh, how much of a range of talent Mr. Lawton had uh, going from uh, being Dr. Moreau in Island of Lost Souls, uh, the, the, the very uh, brutish inspector in Les Miserables, uh, Captain Bly in Mutiny on the Bounty, uh, Ruggles, Ruggles of Red Gap, uh, as, as a, uh, a menacing personality in The Big Clock. Uh, it, th these are, uh, I think, prime uh, examples of what, indeed, a uh, lot could do. And as an aside here, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, Charles Lawton didn't direct more movies than the one film that he did direct, which was in 1955, entitled Night of the Hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever seen that with Robert Mitchum and Shelley Winters, then you have never seen uh, Robert Mitchum at his, uh, probably at his most menacing at that time. Although if you go forward a half a dozen years and watch a film called Cape Fear, you'll say, whoa, wait a second. Uh, uh, our brother Richard could really be uh, extraordinarily menacing without too much effort. But the, the movie uh, was a flop in 1959, and uh, Lawton was uh, very disappointed in the fact that uh, it, it didn't prompt uh, perhaps more offers uh, for him to direct. Uh, it probably should have, because today it's considered to be uh, uh, a prestige film and uh, an exceptional job of direction. So, so let me see if there are any other questions. questions. Yeah. A question about uh, murder trials in court. Sure. How uh, this was this was in England, so he's sitting out there in the middle of everything. Yes. I don't know what happens in the United States. Yeah, it's quite. I mean, that's that's a feature of the English system that is um, actually quite foreign in the United States. We have the, quite the opposite system where we make every effort. Uh, to treat a defendant so that they're not the center of attention. Um, for example, a, a defendants in all cases, not just murder cases, have a, a right to appear in court even if they're incarcerated uh, in civilian clothes and not to have any signs that they're in custody or shackles. Um, and the idea behind that is that until the jury declares a person to be guilty, the person is presumed to be innocent, they should have all the trappings of innocence with them in court. And so, um, you know, the presumption is that they appear not in that setting as if they're in the, you know, that's what we call the dock. But it, yeah, it's very suggestive, exactly. Um, and so we, we bend over backwards to, to try to make that not appear that way. So this was an accurate portrayal, this does happen in England? Like that, that's my understanding, yeah, I've never watched an English trial, but that's my understanding, sure. And, and this system, I mean, the other aspect of this movie that kind of is under the radar, but um, that is foreign to our system, our legal system as well, is this idea between solicitors and barristers. Um, so, uh, you, this